by verse. I'll just teach what I know, and if the Lord wants to add to that, that would be great. So he says in verse 1, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. Notice that it says apostle of Jesus Christ. Well, the definition of apostle is I can't be an apostle because I never physically saw Jesus. So you can't, I believe you have to be physically see the person and be taught by that person and become one of his disciples right there, a follower of his, in order to be called an apostle. I know some people call themselves apostles, but I don't really think you can be called an apostle. We have to be called a disciple, a follower of the Lamb, because I believe that apostle means the eyewitness, also the Heavenly Father. Jesus is an apostle of the Heavenly Father. He talks about that in another part of the Bible. So he was an eyewitness of the Father, his self, and a follower of his Father. And he come to tell the world about it. And the, Paul the Apostle was last of the Apostles, and he saw him in due time. I believe he saw him in the temple. One day he was in a trance, and he saw him speaking to him in the temple right there. So he was a follower of the Lamb. He was schooled by Jesus. And at one point, actually, in the book of Galatians, that he went to Jerusalem to see if Jesus taught him the same thing Peter and them was preaching and teaching right there. So Paul got his information by the Lord, the Bible talks about. When he went to Arabia and it was in Damascus, he was strengthening him, he received meat. I believe that meant he was in Arabia, and the Lord taught him. And then he learned later on some things from the apostles and different things. So let's look at this. He says, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect. And I, I look at that, I'm like, according to the faith of God's elect, I believe that Paul the apostle persecuted the church and the church prayed for the apostle Paul right there. And also Later on, he learned it from them. So he says, according to the faith of God's elect or God's chosen, and an acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness. So the only way to get saved is to acknowledge the truth right there. Receive the truth. That is the power of God unto salvation is that precious gospel right there. So he says, in hope of eternal life. When, when I got saved, I had that hope of eternal life, which is Jesus. He is that eternal life right there. He says, oh, in hope of eternal life, which God, that cannot lie, promised before the world began. Notice that. Which God cannot lie. He promised this about Jesus coming one day, before the foundation of the world, the Bible talks about. It's been here before the foundation of the world. God knew exactly on this earth, he knew exactly that Adam and Eve was going to fall to sin. He knew that uh, Cain and Abel and Cain was going to kill his brother. God knew everything before it happened. And, and the Bible says 1,000 1, years like one day to the Lord. So... If you look at it in the eyes of the Lord, this earth's been here about almost 7,000 years. Men's been created about 7,000 years. And it's just like one week to the Lord. The Lord is going to solve it all. The Lord's going to put the devil in his place. Somebody said, well, why is God allowing this to happen? He's going to take care of just shortly right there. So he says, but having due time. Notice that God is always on time. In due time, manifested his word through preaching. Manifested means made known his word through preaching. That's a big statement right there. Now, you could preach through the word of testimony. There's many different ways to preach. You could preach through the word of testimony. You could preach the way you live. That's the greatest preaching you'll ever do is the way you live. you got to remember that. And then you could become a bishop or a pastor of a church, or you become an evangelist. The Bible says some 
pastors, some teachers, some preachers, some evangelists, some prophets right there. You know what I mean? So we, there's many different ways to preach the gospel. That's how precious souls get saved. You preach to them Jesus, pr uh, preach to them Jesus, the death, burial, and resurrection right there. And when they believe that with all their heart, they will turn from their wicked ways in their heart and cry out to Jesus and they'll be saved. As simple as that. I cried out in my heart. When I was 20 years old, Jesus dealt with my heart. And he spoke to me that night. And I tell you, I believed it with all my heart. You know what God said to me that night? He said, if you don't get saved now, I'll never deal with you again. And I just poured my heart out to I let go of the world then. I believed it with all my heart, and I cried out with all my heart. And Jesus come in my heart and saved me just like I was. Been a brand new creature ever since Jesus got alive in my heart. He says, but hath in due time manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me according to the commandment of our God. Let me read that again. As, which is committed unto me, that's Paul, the gospel is committed unto him, and you can put yourself in that category, if you're born again, if you're saved, the gospel is committed to your trust, what are you going to do with it? Think about that. God wants us to use that gospel, to, that's the key to getting precious souls saved, that's the key to life right there, of getting precious souls saved, is the preaching and the demonstration of the Holy Spirit, the preaching of the word of the Lord, right there, telling somebody about Jesus, being a light to a lost and dying world, right there. That's the power of God unto salvation. So he says, which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior. Notice that. I believe in the Trinity. I believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And the Bible says them three are one. But three different individuals but they make up the Godhead right there. And Jesus is the Son of God. And he prayed to the Heavenly Father in the garden right there. And one day, if you look in uh, Corinthians chapter 15, Jesus is going to give the power back to God and subject himself to the Lord himself. Notice that right there. Look it up. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Jesus himself is going to subject himself to the Father when it's all said and done. He says, To Titus, my own son. Now this is how we know that he wrote to Titus because he said, Titus, my own son after the common faith. Now I don't believe this word Titus was at the top of the page when Paul wrote that. I believe that was added by man. There's nothing wrong with that, but I'm just telling you, they, they read this and they saw the word Titus. They realized that he was writing to Titus. And he wrote that up at the top. So he says, To Titus, my own son, after the common faith. Right there. So that tells me that Paul the Apostle helped get him saved right there and born again. And he says, Grace, mercy, and peace. And Paul always said that in his writing. Grace, mercy, and peace. I want grace, mercy, and peace for everybody. I want this world to, to live in peace, but I especially want the children of the Lord to have peace, you know. I love the children of God. The Bible says, do good to all men, but especially of those that are of the household of faith. And he says, to Titus, my own son, after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. Notice that. God the Father the Father's the one that sits on the throne. And then the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, the second part of the Godhead right there. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. And then he said in verse 3, God our Savior. Notice that right there. And then he separates from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. Notice that right there. For this cause left I thee in Crete. There's a little island called Crete and Paul on his way to Rome and he was taken captive on his way to Rome. They had a stop at this island right there 
and he won some of those people to the Lord. And also the Christians were there at the day of Pentecost, and they heard Peter and the eleven preach the word of the Lord, and some of them got saved right there. Later on, Paul goes back, and he helps establish some of these churches and helps win them to the Lord, drops Titus off right here. So he says, For this cause let thy thee in Crete. Looks like to me if you left somebody there, that means you had to be there yourself. He says, For this cause left thy thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting or the things that are needful or lacking, and ordain elders in every city right there. God left it to man to ordain preachers and things like that, to set up preachers and, and prove them out, you know, and see if they be of the faith first. got to be saved before you're going to be a preacher. And then you got to start living for the Lord. And then, in order to be a bishop, you got to be blameless. You can't have no skeletons in the closet and things like that and you can't have more than you can't have two wives and, and things like that you got to be blameless let's just read what he says and ordain elders in every city as i had appointed thee notice that he appointed him to do this he says if any be blameless the husband of one wife notice that right there if any be blameless that's a big statement I mean, we ought to all look at ourselves. Are we blameless? You know, we know that we can't be perfect, and Paul the Apostle did not think he was perfect. You can read that through his writings right there. He said, oh, wretched man that I am. That means that he was right then and there when he was writing that. So that he is, not that he was, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death. He's talking about his old wretched body right there. So blameless. The husband of one wife, notice that right there. That puts the category of the bishop of the church being a man, not a lady. And he says that in 1 Timothy chapter 3 also. So he says, the husband of one wife, notice that. And he's one wife, so you can debate and say, well, you know, if you've been divorced, you can't be a pastor. I know the Baptist Church teaches that, but there's another thought there, if you think about it. I've only been married one time. I'm still married to the same lady, thank God. But is he really saying that? You can look at it in Bible days. They had more than one wife in Bible days. Abraham had more than one wife. Samson's, I think Samson's dad was married to two ladies. David was married to several ladies. Solomon was married to several ladies. That was a tradition back then, but that wasn't the will of the Lord from the get-go. It's two to be one for death do their part right there. But is he talking about somebody that's been divorced? I don't know. I mean, I really don't know. Or is he talking about somebody with two wives at the same time? You know, you got to think about it. you got to think about this also, that people, before they get saved, they have a past. And then once they get saved, God washes that away. Can they be a pastor if they done been divorced? I'm not talking about if they're Christian, then they get divorced. But I'm talking about before they got saved. You know what I'm saying? And somebody said, well, how do you know? I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that if I if I was divorced and before I got saved and God called me to pastor, I would know if it was right or wrong because I would feel God's presence when I'm preaching. So, just something for you to think about right there. It says, having faithful children not accused of riot or unruly. I got something to say right there. <clears throat> faithful children, where they're going to be disobedient, but you're doing your best to keep them in line. Especially when they're young, you do your best to keep them in line. You have to tune their fannies up. We're not talking about abusing them. We're talking about spanking them in the rear end, spanking them in the rear end, not cold cocking them, not abusing them, not hurting them, not bruising them, not beating them like a horse. I'm just talking about spanking them. They don't need you to beat them like a horse. Just spank their little fannies right there. They need that. But you're keeping your kids under control don't mean your kids are going to, you know, not do things. We see the 
some of the greatest men in the Bible that had disobedient kids right there. If you just look at it, some of the most famous, I'm thinking, uh, Samuel, look what his kids did. They took bribes. They had problems. You know what I mean? Different ones in the Bible had problems. Children. But they, those men of God did what it took to try to keep them in line as long as they was in the house. Don't mean they was perfect, but they set some ground rules and, and made them subject. You know what I mean? He says, having faithful children not accused of riot. Is it a sin to riot? Yes, it is. I mean, you might go protest peacefully out there. That's great. But when you're rioting and, and hurting people and busting things up and private property, and that's not right. And then there's riotous living. You know, you're just living like the devil. You're going to bars. You're doing drugs. You know, you're whoremongering, whatever. Riotous living. No. It says, an unruly. Ain't we living in an unruly generation, a riotous generation? Kids are not, they ain't got no control, they ain't got no backbone, they ain't got no godliness in them, you know what I mean? They got this modern so-called religion in them, but not real true salvation, not real good Bible, you know, living, and things like that. It says, for a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God. There's nothing wrong with being called a bishop, I call it a pastor. In different parts of the Bible it says pastor, but right here it says bishop. It said must be blameless as the steward of God. We're stewards of God. We we are God. We're taking care of the Bible. We're taking care of the church. We're we're taking care of the name of Jesus right here. We represent Jesus down here. We're we're supposed to be good stewards of the word of the Lord right there. It says we're supposed to be a light to a lost and dying world. We're supposed to practice what we preach. He said, not self-willed, not soon anger, self-willed. Think about that. You're not living for the Lord. You're just doing your own little thing. You're in your own little world. But Christians are supposed to live for the Lord. They're supposed to be subject to God. So he says, not soon angered. There, we can get angry at sin and sin not, the Bible says. Sometimes we do. A righteous anger. God get angry with the wicked every day. And so does the children of the Lord. I hate sin. I don't hate sinners, but I hate sin. But sometimes we're in our flesh. We're not doing it in the Spirit of God. We're doing it in the flesh. So that's what he's talking about right there. Not soon angered at a drop of a hat. Not given to wine. Now, this right here, we see this in the book of Timothy. We see different types, uh, wine, different types of wine through the Bible and things like that. And somebody would argue and say, this is just uh, grape juice, or they would say, yes, fermented, and things like that. Well, this is what I say right there. We don't know for sure, and I'm not about to preach that it's okay to drink a little wine. I'm not about to preach that, because I don't know for sure about this right here. I think it had a little ferment in it. I really do, and I can't hardly explain it, but the reason I think is because it says that the ladies can drink a little bit, the deacons can drink a little bit, but the pastor cannot drink a little bit. So is he talking about grape juice? The pastor can't drink grape juice? So think about that a little bit. But this is why I tell my congregation, I said no Christian has no right drinking even a little bit of alcohol beverage. You don't have no right to have alcohol in your house. So I say to all Christians, to all believers and all people that are trying to follow the Lord, get the booze out of your house. Get the wine out of your house. I'm just drinking one municipal wine, a cup of wine a day. It'll keep the doctor away. I don't need to keep the doctor away like that. I want to be sober-minded, clear-thinking. I say just stay away from it. I don't drink wine. I'm just fine. You know what I mean? I don't drink alcohol, booze and things like that. I'm just fine. God, God keeps us. You know what I mean? I, my wife's grandmama died today, and she was 94 years old. She didn't drink wine. So 
people use that excuse, well, that keeps the doctor away. That's good for you. Well, she was 94 years old. She didn't need to drink wine. So think about that. That's just excuses that the devil makes. No Christian has no right to drink alcoholic beverages. I knew that right when I got saved. I knew a Christian ain't supposed to drink. I mean, my conscience also bear witness in the Holy Ghost. I think people use that as a crutch, and I just say, stay away from it right there. Stay away from it. Drink you some great, great juice right there, <laughs> you know. That'll give you all the vitamins and all the nutrition you need. Just wealth is grape juice, something like that. Go squeeze you some oranges or some grapes or something. Don't bring wine into it. So he says, not no striker, and you can look at that a couple different ways, striking people or standing up in the picket line, striking them. You know, you think about it. I don't know exactly if that's what that means or not, but it says no striker. It said nor not given to filthy lucre. That's the greedy gain of money. Ain't that the way a lot of preachers are today? If you want me to marry you, it's going to cost about $3,000. Or they'll say, $300, and you can do that. I'll do it for you. I never ask for money. People people try to give me money, I tell them no. But they keep insisting, I'll use it to the glory of God. You know, last, last funeral I preached, I wasn't expecting nothing. They gave me some, and I just put it to the glory of God. You know, I did something at the church with it. You know what I mean? I ain't got myself out for a handout. I'm not saying a preacher don't can't get paid to preach. I'm just saying don't be running that filthy lucre right there. Preacher's supposed to be totally for the Lord and the house of the Lord, especially if he's got a big congregation, you know. It says, but a lover of hospitality. All Christians need to be hospitable. That don't mean to give to some bum off the street that don't want to work. The Bible says if you don't want to work, if you're able and you don't want to work, you should not eat. That's what the Bible says. But give it to somebody that really needs it, not to somebody that plays like they need it, that don't want to work. Give it to somebody that really needs it. Put it to a good cause. It's not just money. You're giving things, you know, from the heart. 